So here we are now with Tefica fellow Jeffrey Snover, who's here to talk about how he's taking steps to actively challenge himself and change his career uh, and staying ahead of the constantly changing technical landscape. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. Yeah, great to be here, Rick. Now, in the past, you've talked about managing and navigating your career. We've had conversations about this in the hallway, we've had conversations about this during different video productions, that sort of stuff, but I noticed that you've recently made a change within Microsoft, uh, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, really big change. Yeah, so um, you're currently now, um, uh, your, your I'm current now role? The, uh, a still technical fellow, right. and I'm the architect for the Office 365 Intelligence Substrate. Okay, I need you to unpack that a little bit for me right now, because <laughs> uh, what, what kind of caused you to make you start looking for that particular kind of a change? Yeah, so really stuff? sort of at the end of the last year, a number of things kind of came together mm -hmm. and made me decide that it was time for a change. Okay. So the first, as you know, we often at Microsoft have this phrase that says, you know, if you aren't scared of your job, at least every couple of years, it's time to find a new job. Correct, yes. So really, I'd, I'd been, you know, gotten comfortable with my job. You yeah, know, I was not uncomfortable. Right, you, you started off on the, uh, from what I know you from, from the last little while, started off with technical, fellow, or with a distinguished engineer, PowerShell creation. Yep. Uh, but then you made a change over to the server side of things. Yep, Windows Server. Right. Yep. And then after that, now you're into uh, the status of working with the Intelligent Substrate. Yeah, well, and in between there There's one was between. Azure Stack. Oh, oh yes, yeah. yes. And so what actually, so that was one thing. You sort of got uncomfortable. <laughs> one of the reasons why I've been got a, got comfortable was that there was a reorganization mm -hmm. and the Azure Stack work and the Windows Server work got split and I got moved over to Azure Stack. Mm -hmm. And so I was working in that area. So it was a much reduced scope of role. And you know, we, at Microsoft, we really have about 10 individual contributor technical fellows. Okay. Right, 10. That's not a lot for a company right. of 140,000 people. Yeah, and, and about $100 billion. So <laughs> kind of directionally, each technical fellow should be working at something that's sort of line of sight to about $10 billion. Right, okay, so good math. So reduced scope is, wasn't really the right place to be. And then lastly, you know, just honestly, um, in the part of the reorganization, I got paired up with a new executive, mm -hmm. and in reality, our, our, our styles didn't mesh particularly well. And, you know, uh, a technical fellow always pairs with an executive mm -hmm. to get big things done. So if that isn't a great working relationship, it's hard to be effective. And my job is to help make that executive ex uh, 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 successful. And so these, these three combinations made me say, yeah, it's time for a change. Now, other people in the audience are kind of kind of finding themselves in that position potentially. They might be yeah. aligned in certain different working group members or whichever. Um, what made you make that choice and that change to go off and follow off with a new uh, a new executive in that new area? Oh, uh, that is it? to say, the, to go to the Azure Stack, yes. or the new one. Uh, the new one, like yeah. the, the Azure the Stack one. piece. I can see a logical progression, right? Yep. I see the sta the progression of management, control plane, PowerShell, going into the Windows Server yeah. architecture space, and then in the stack. To me, I can see the logical progression. Absolutely. But then you kind of went like hockey stick in different directions. Exactly. So basically, when I decided I was going to make a change, I did the deep step back and say, okay, well what kind of change am I going to make? Mm -hmm. And the first thing I did was to, to, to decide the big question, like, am I done, <laughs> right? Well, I guess so, I, that's, that's, a, that's a big topic to have to unpack. Well, right, there. I've been working since I've been 12, right? right? right. Uh, I've been in the business about 40 years, I'm showing some of my <laughs> miles. Um, and so basically it's like, hey, sort of am I done, or am I done in a year, or three years? Am I you know, on a path to, glide path to retirement? And I thought about that seriously, and then okay. thought, no, actually, you know, what gives me energy is my work. Mm -hmm. I love technology. Uh, you know, if I retire, what would I do? And it's like, technology. Yeah. So I thought, <laughs> no, you know, I'm not done. So that was sort of the first question. So then um, I pursued, you know, figured out, well, what am I going to do next? And and that was a that was a hard hard step. So basically, what I did was I thought, well, geez. <clears throat> I've not looked for a job in 20 years. Right. I really have no idea what to do. And this is where you know, individual psychology comes in, right? The imposter syndrome, I've talked about right, that in the right. past. And uh, so these you know, mean little voices in my head, so it's like, oh, well, you, know, you're, you won't be able to get another job, you know, nobody wants to talk to you, it's mm -hmm. like, oh no, what do I do? So and you were seriously thinking about leaving Microsoft at one point for yeah. just your exploration of what to do. Well, as I thought through, you know, what do I want to do, um, you know, just, just, yeah, so it wasn't sure. Right. And so basically, you know, I pretty much continually get these, you know, knocks on the door from headhunters, et cetera. And so I thought, well, okay, well, maybe I should just talk to one of those guys. Mm. And so indeed, I talked to some external company, and I had an external interview. 
Uh, and thankfully, you didn't go down that path. It was a complete disaster. <laughs> One of the best things that happened. You had interviewed in 20 years. Exactly. You get a little bit rusty at it. Exactly. And so I realized, you know, I went there, I was having this conversation in the middle of it. I'm like, what the heck am I doing here? Like, this is a weird <laughs> conversation. And it, it was great because it was so spectacularly bad that it made me step back and say, hey, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. Like, get your act together. What do you want? Okay. And what do you bring to the picture? Got it. I was like, okay, what do I want? And then I said, okay. Yeah, what do I care about? What do I care about? And I realized there are three things that I care about. Number one, and most important, was I was ready for a deep new technical challenge. Okay. Right, a job that I didn't know how to do. Right, a job that was going to scare me. A job that was going to grow my skills. You know, because, you know, you get something, you give something. Right. I've been a lot of, like, given, performing. It was time to, like, sharpen the tools, if you will. Got it. That was number one. Number two was I wanted a mission. Right, a mission, something that at the end of it, the world is a better place because I, we, we did that work. Right. And then number three was, I wanted to work on a great team. And a great team, that is to say, not our harmonious team where everybody's happy in this false harmony, mm -hmm. but a team where we're challenging each other, saying, hey, let's, you know, we're doing important things, let's be great. So those are the three things I started looking for. Now, were you able to bring a lot of your, what I call tribal knowledge with you into this new environment, uh, into this new world of things, because it is, again, a pretty big change. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> None at all? Well, at the beginning, I, th I thought no. Okay. Uh, I had, uh, so basically, I, I got a new role, and that new role is in <clears throat> with Office. Right. And, uh, and basically, I had um, over, or sorry, underestimated what a change moving to Office and then getting involved in AI was. Okay. Office really is like a completely different company, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, we've talked about this before. You know, at Microsoft, everyone's got, you know, 10 jobs. Their only two job is to figure out which nine they can screw up and not get fired. <laughs> nice. So basically, nice. if it's not something you're focused in on directly, you pay no attention to it. Well, it turns out while I was like focused in on these things around server and, and uh, management, uh, my friends in office had been spending a couple billion dollars a year in R&D. Got it, got so it. So this is corpus of work that was just incredible that I knew nothing about, right? So different code term, t technologies, code names, mm -hmm. projects, uh, ways to develop software, uh, ways to evaluate software, ways to look and how to run things. Everything was completely different. In fact, my joke, actually pretty seriously, was that for the first four months, like all the meetings I went to could have been held in Russian for as much as I understood. <laughs> I mean, literally, there's this thing that says, excuse me, what does that mean? If I did that, I mean, every single sentence would be like that. Right. It was that non-plussing. It was that confusing. Got it. So that was really quite a challenge. And then AI as well. AI, <clears throat> uh, I had uh, underestimated or you sort of misestimated where AI was. It's really hard to overstate how much at the beginning of the beginning of the beginning we are with AI. Mm -hmm. And so I got involved in AI, and as I started like reading the docs, all these documents are like these super scholastic documents, right? Things you'd write, uh, you know, somebody get going for their PhD would write. Like typically when we, you know, Windows Server, when we talk about a technology, we write a white paper, and that white paper is written in a tone and a mindset that says, hey, how do I communicate these ideas for the maximum number of people to address, mm -hmm. understand? Whereas with AI, that's not the case. With AI, it's still very much this academic world of these PhDs writing sort of scholarly do documents to impress other PhDs people. So mm -hmm. it's really quite a, quite a surprise. So the answer to your question, hey, can I bring my tribal knowledge? At the f beginning, I looked and I said, no. Like, what have I got myself involved with? Mm -hmm. Like, they, you know, often I thought, maybe, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe, maybe I should have taken that other path and retired, you know? Right. Become a golf pro or something. Um, so it was really quite challenging. And so now you're at the state where you're inside the new job, things are good, and you're now challenging yourself. It's met your three requirements yes. uh, for everything else. Any parting advice for someone that's out there looking right now for what they could do to put themselves and feel comfortable with their own kind of situation? Yeah, so uh, you know, first I'd, let me just say that <clears throat> in the end, having gotten through that uh, discomfort, I then realized as I kind of took a deep breath, and by the way, this was like months, months, months of uncomfortable. Right. Like, 
sustained uncomfortableness. Mm -hmm. And there were various points where I said, hey, maybe I made the wrong decision, maybe I should have stayed where I was or done something more, a little less challenging. Right. But then having pushed through that, what I then realized was, hey, there's a lot of AI being done here, it's a lot of AI science. Mm -hmm. What we actually need is a lot of AI engineering, right? Hey, well, number one, though, I say, I break it down and you, uh, now bring my skill set. My skill set is to turn mountains into molehills, right? So there's this big mountain, it's a big mess. Eh, at the end of the day, I've only got to get two things. One is, I got to let unicorns be unicorns. Mm -hmm. There are these AI unicorns, special deep learning scientists, da da da. The reality is that those guys aren't doing much unicorning because it's so hard to do the work, right? The tool chains, the systems, right. the access to the data, the access to compute, the access to uh, 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 the workflows means that they're doing very little of their unicorning. They've got a bunch of work where they're not. So number one is let these unicorns be unicorns. Right. Number two is let these horses be unicorns. How do I go and take something that right now only the expert elite can do mm -hmm. and turn it into something that everybody can do? Right. And there, you know what? That's all about building platforms, building systems, growing capacity. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to say one of my goals is to increase our ability to do AI by three to five orders of magnitude. Right. Now when you put that in your head, three to five orders of magnitude, you realize that incrementalism is not your friend. Mm -hmm. And whereas the things we're doing are important, what we really need to do is to focus in on these things. And then I break it down. Access to data, access to uh, workflows, access to uh, compute, access to toolkits, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, break that down, turn it into programs. So in the end, the answer was yes. Yep. But I had to go through a very long and profound period of discomfort for doing that. So, indeed, I encourage everybody to do these things. You know, uncomfortable is the new norm. Right. You know, if you're not uncomfortable, it means you're still in your comfort zone, which means you aren't pushing the edge. Mm -hmm. Our industry's changing so fast that if you're not pushing the edge, you are, you are becoming obsolete. You're end up being left behind. Exactly. Right. And as a leader, you should be even more uncomfortable. You need to be leading, so you've got to bear the burden of that uncomfortableness. So I guess I'd say that anybody kind of looking at this similar thing, I would say take a look at your core intrinsic motivations. Mm -hmm. Like what gets you out of bed, what keeps you motivated? Because um, that's the thing that's going to sustain you. And so again, it was when I looked and I said, well, you know what's, what core motivates me is you know, technology, yep. I love technology, and I love having an impact on the world and working with great teams. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that made me say, in the midst of all this kind of uh, turmoil and despair, I was looking and I say, well, am I learning something? Man, I'm learning a lot, yeah. every day. A lot, a lot, a lot. Do I feel that I can contribute? It's like, after a while, I wasn't sure, mm -hmm. but then after a while, it's like, no, actually, I think uh, I might be exactly the right guy here, right? Which is to say, hey, how do we transform this great science into great engineering? You know, at scale platform thinking. Guess what, Windows is one of the largest platforms. <laughs> how do we take some of the lessons and scar tissues I use there and apply it here? Right. Um, and Everything that we've got so far, you've got good advice for the individuals out there. I want to thank you very much for your time, for being with us and, and, and stopping by. I know that you've got some demo prep that you have to do. Yep. Often talk to the people. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, for joining me. And Thanks. thank you for joining us here on the Microsoft Tonight stage, here and live.